recording. So thank you all for coming. And um, the way I thought we'd start off this evening is uh, I'd say a prayer. Um, Eric and uh, Eric, sorry, Lori <laughs> and Anna are going to present to us about COVID-19. They're going to talk for about 15 minutes. They have a slideshow. This way we can all get kind of on the same page about where we are at with this. Um, I, asked her, I also asked Alex to be here to answer any questions too that you might have. Um, and just to get, get your all insights about what we should be doing and, and when we should possibly start meeting again. Um, after um, Anna and Lori uh, are done, um, I'll just talk a little bit about the documents that I sent out to you, then we can just get your all insights and, um, and then uh, we'll be discerning together with the council when to start in-person worship again. Um, I am very grateful that you all came. And uh, just a reminder, I sent out a survey to you all a little while ago. If you all could fill those out uh, and send it in, that'd be great. It's, it's really good information to have about uh, also your pr perspectives on, on what uh, we should be doing. So, so thank you for that. Um, hold on one second, I'm letting somebody else in. Okay. Would you all uh, join me and in prayer? Merciful and gracious God, we give you thanks for this evening, for the chance to gather uh, virtually with everybody. God, would you keep us safe? Would you keep us healthy? God, we also pray that your, um, that your discerning spirit would come amongst us as we discern how and when to uh, restart in-person worship. So, so give us the wisdom um, and the guidance to, to do your will. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to unmute myself and Lori and uh, Anna, you can go ahead. All right, um, we, Pastor Josh, it says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So you would be the host. Yeah, he's working. under the security icon. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. All right, let's have the thumbs up if you can see a screen. Got it? Okay. Fantastic. Let me see if I can make it move. Okay, where's my pointer? Okay, are you starting on me? Okay, uh, so as background, um, we thought it would be interesting to dive in a little bit about just uh, what is this virus and uh, what does it mean kind of from the science perspective and, and the implications of that in our daily lives, of course. Uh, so COVID-19 uh, stands for coronavirus disease uh, that emerged in 2019. And then the name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2. Um, so this is very similar to the SARS virus that you may remember uh, from 2003. And uh, what it looks like, uh, this is a false color picture of what it looks like, uh, but it's an electron microscopy picture. Um, so the virus is basically an RNA virus with a little uh, surrounding membrane and then these little projections uh, that help it get into cells. Coronaviruses are actually a huge family of viruses in a, in a large number of species um, and they do cross species. So they're able to infect uh, humans as well as other species. This virus um, seems to have originated in horseshoe bats but the scientists are still uh, trying to pin down exactly uh, where it came from. And then of course, uh, people like to compare uh, what is the difference between this virus and the flu because they're both respiratory viruses. Um, 
uh, COVID-19 has a longer incubation period than the flu. Uh, it also has more asymptomatic spread. And what that means is that there's higher uh, transmission because people can be walking around feeling just fine um, and not knowing that they're infected. Uh, yet uh, on the left here, this is a picture of a cell and the orange, um, the orange little balls basically on here is the virus that has uh, virus particles that have replicated inside the cells and then burst out of the cell. Um, uh, so as you can imagine, you get a lot of virus particles for any one cell that's infected. Um, it's estimated that there needs to be 60 to 70% of people um, that would be immune before the pandemic ends. And the current estimate of Californians is we're at 1.6%. Uh, of Californians who have been infected in total. So of course, this means that vaccines are extremely important. I, I have to give a shout out to all the medical and scientific uh, inquiry, uh, because of course, this is a, a brand new virus. It didn't used to be in humans up until December. And there's been global um, collaborations and just a huge amount of open sharing of scientific data. Uh, this was published last week in, in um, one of the highest, uh, most prestigious journals called Cell. Uh, basically, um, what they did was they looked all along the respiratory tract at different, at different cell types, and they looked to see where does the virus infect. And so on the left, anything that's red here is, is the SARS virus, and then the blue are the cells. And this top one is from the trachea, so very high up in your respiratory. The next one uh, is further down in your lungs, the bronchiole uh, and uh, alveoli cells. And you can see there's not nearly as much infection uh, deep in the lung because it's only a certain cell type uh, uh, that deep that has the uh, receptors. So of course, with an upper respiratory infection, that means when you cough or sneeze, uh, everything's widely available <laughs> to be coughed and sneezed out. Uh, because it's in the upper part of your uh, respiratory tract. And that's why, um, of course, masks are needed. This is just a little schematic of, of what the virus is made of. Um, it's actually pretty simple. It's a little ball. Um, it's got a membrane, a bilipid membrane, and then it's got these little spikes on it. And the spikes are basically what will attach to the human cell uh, receptors uh, that allow it then to enter into the cell. And, and as I just showed on the previous slide, it only enters certain cells. Uh, most of those are in the respiratory tract, but the receptors are also found in other cells in the body, such as the gut. And, and it's believed that that may be why uh, some people can get diarrhea as a symptom. Um, and also other cell types, uh, including heart, kidney, liver, and so on. It's called coronavirus. Uh, corona just means crown. Uh, so when this was, uh, when these types of viruses were first looked at under the microscope, uh, they had this nice ring around them that was kind of pretty, and it looks like a crown. <laughs> so, uh, but then the little spiky parts um, uh, are the part that will adhere to human cells to allow them to infect. And then the symptoms, uh, of course, go along with the infection. Um, so this is uh, straight from the CDC. And um, I can uh, share these slides with Pastor Josh so that you can have them because uh, on each slide, I've also given links down at the bottom where you can look at the original references and, and read more about anything you're interested in. Um, but these are the general symptoms, uh, fatigue, loss of sense of smell and taste, cough, fever, uh, muscle aches, and so on. Kids do not seem to be as symptomatic. And it's also thought that they might not uh, uh, carry the virus uh, for as long. So either their infections are more mild or they're just somehow a little bit uh, better equipped to deal with it. Generally speaking, when kids get the virus, they get it from adults around them. Um, the symptoms are also um, a little bit more brief, uh, but I think part of that could be just because kids haven't been studied as much. There are um, uh, rare cases where children uh, can get a very severe uh, disease. Uh, Kawasaki? Kawasaki, yeah, which is a, basically a, a hyperimmune response. And then, of course, the really tricky thing about this virus uh, compared, for instance, to the original SARS, is that a, a fairly significant portion of people are asymptomatic, um, which means they can be infected, but they really just don't feel bad. 
And the reason that's, a, I mean, that's good for them, <laughs> but the reason that's a problem is because if they're out uh, acting normal because they feel fine, they can be spreading the virus. And then of course, um, uh, the reason there's so much concern about is that a subset of people, uh, a minority of people can be severely ill. So there are uh, mortality and deaths associated with the virus. Uh, the risk factors for the severe illness are uh, listed here. Again, this is uh, from the CDC. Um, and I just showed uh, one graph uh, for the first two characteristics here, age and uh, being male is actually a risk factor. And uh, over here on the right, these numbers may be too hard to see, but this is US uh, COVID deaths split by age and gender. And so uh, gender, uh, male men here are in blue and the gray line are women. And, uh, and of course it's rising with each decade of age. So this chart starts at uh, 44 years and then every decade, 45 to 54, 55, 65, 75, and 85. So you can see there's a dramatic increase in the severity of disease um, starting basically around age 65. And the virus, uh, of course, because it lives in the up, largely in the upper respiratory, that's how it spreads. Um, so it spreads through droplets, aerosols, or fomites. And the difference is um, shown here on the right in this little schematic. Um, so if this um, person on the left here that has the red color, if they uh, cough or are breathing heavily or something, uh, the virus will be uh, emitted and can be transmitted um, either in droplets, uh, which is defined by this certain size, uh, fomites, which are just bigger, heavier droplets, so they drop to the surface, uh, and that's why we want to clean everything, um, or aerosols if they're uh, very tiny particles. And uh, of course, um, what this means is that uh, we can prevent transmissions by wearing masks. Uh, we can also prevent transmissions by cleaning uh, the surfaces where uh, there may be droplets or, or anything. Uh, they have studied how stable the virus is. Um, basically, of course, you can kill the virus with well, soap and water. Um, you can kill it with disinfectants, alcohol. Um, uh, it will die on its own uh, if, if something has dried out. Uh, if you, uh, there have been studies looking at how fast, uh, if you put the virus on a surface, how fast it can dry out and, and uh, die so that it will no longer be infectious. Uh, that also relates to the size of the droplet uh, because if it's a big moist <laughs> droplet and, and the bigger it is, uh, the longer that the virus particles can last just because they won't have dried out. Um, one very important uh, aspect is that uh, the virus is most contagious before and during the first week of symptoms. Um, so while it's getting a hold um, and uh, starting to replicate in your throat uh, and your nasal passages, um, that's when you have the most transmission. So right before you feel symptoms and right when the symptoms are onsetting. Okay, so Anna's gonna take over. Yes, so as uh, my mom always says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So one of the really important things we can do to help prevent uh, the spread of COVID-19 is to wear a mask. And so as you can see in the graphic over here on the slide, uh, if a healthy person is not wearing a mask and they interact with a sick person who's also not wearing a mask, there's a very high probability of transmission. And then if the healthy person is wearing a mask, but the unhealthy person is not, then there's still, you know, moderately high probability of transmission. And then if the COVID-19 carrier is wearing a mask, but the healthy person is not wearing a mask, that lowers the probability of transmission more. And then if both of them are wearing a mask, that's when you get the lowest possible transmission probability. So the important takeaway here is that we want everyone to be wearing masks because as my mom has mentioned multiple times and the point we one of the points we really want to drive home is that there are a fair number of asymptomatic carriers at least 25 percent that's the current estimate and since you won't necessarily know if you're carrying the virus or not it's safest to just wear a mask and to have everyone wearing a mask and then so a few more things we can do to prevent the spread of COVID-19, according to the CDC, 
are washing your hands often, avoid touching your facial area, mm -hmm. avoid close contact with other, with other people, which of course involves social distancing, staying home as much as possible, not gathering in groups, staying out of crowds, that sort of thing. Wearing a cloth face cover, as we said, wearing a mask of some sort when you do have to go out. Uh, covering your coughs and sneezes, of course, not into your hand. I would like to add preferably into an elbow or into a sleeve or something like that. Uh, cleaning and disinfecting surfaces, as we said. And then, of course, monitor, monitoring your health and monitoring how you're feeling. Uh, because even though, as we said, people can be symptomatic, there's still uh, the vast majority of the population will feel symptoms. So it's very important to monitor your personal health and keep that in check. And if you are ill, you should stay home at least 14 days um, and then an additional three days with no symptoms. And so um, due to the current state of the pandemic, there is no zero risk outing right now. So if you leave your house, you're putting yourself at risk and you're putting others at risk. So some low risk activities at the moment are spending a day at the beach, going to a vacation house with another household, camping, exercising outdoors, not in a crowd, again. Uh, lower to medium risk would be staying in a hotel or having a backyard uh, gathering with one other household. Medium to high risk would be something like an outdoor wedding celebration because there are more people eating indoors at a restaurant because there is, uh, uh, the ventilation isn't as good as it is outside. Getting a haircut, same thing, ventilation problems. And then high risk activities would include choir, uh, indoor religious services, unfortunately, nightclubs and exercising in gyms and that sort of thing. And super spreader events, which are things like gyms, loud bars, choirs, churches, et cetera, are thought to be responsible for approximately 80% of COVID infections. So we're trying to stay away from those things now to not exacerbate the current problem. <laughs> and the general rule of thumb for transmission risk is the more time you spend around people, the closer in space you are around people, um, and the higher number of people you interact with, those things all increase your risk, especially if you are indoors. Because when you are outdoors, the air is circulating much more freely. And indoors, obviously, you're not, you're not in open air. <laughs> so of course, the air is going to be more closely contained. And then, so the current status in San Mateo County, as of May 31st of this year, there are 2,165 total cases. And as you can see in the graphic on the left, there's, it's leveling off-ish. Um, the big spike in the middle of April that you see was, um, for whatever reason, there was just a really huge influx of data that day. Um, that's what caused it, that was kind of an anomaly. Um, but overall, San Mateo County is doing relatively well and we seem to be flattening in general. Um, and then cases by age group and deaths by age, by age group is the graphic on the right. And this, as you can see, demonstrates that the age group with the most cases here is the 30 to 39 year old age group. However, the age group with the most, most deaths is the 90 plus age group, even though they have the fewest number of, um, number of infections. So this, again, clearly demonstrates that age is definitely a risk factor, especially 65 plus, as we said before. So that's why people need to be extra, extra cautious um, when, when you're older and to take as many precautions as possible and avoid going out as much as possible. So here's a look into the future. There are lots and lots and lots of vaccines being tested and the possible outcomes are um, great, which would mean the vaccine prevents the disease and eradicates it, like the smallpox vaccine, for example. Another possibility is that the vaccine is good, which means it would lessen the severity of the disease, like the influenza vaccines. And then the last possibility uh, for an outcome is not good, which means the vaccine could worsen the disease in some people by enhancing the immune response, which is definitely something we do not want. And then another uh, solution we're looking for uh, to control the virus is uh, contact tracing, which you may or may not have heard about. 
And this essentially involves um, installing apps in people's phones or some sort of wearable device that could stop outbreaks early and save lives by tracking the people that the infected individuals come into contact with. But with this comes the need to address various privacy concerns as well. And so and in terms of how long this will last, it's estimated that the length of this pandemic will be approximately 18 to 24 months. And scientists have uh, made three possible model scenarios for what exactly this will look like over the course of the next uh, year to year and a half or so, year, to, year and a half to two years. So as you can see in the graphic on the left, uh, scenario one, peaks and valleys, uh, which essentially means that the spring 2020 COVID-19 wave is followed by a series of repetitive smaller waves that occur through the summer and consistently over approximately one to, one to two years and then gradually diminish. Then the fall peak uh, in which the spring, the spring wave is followed by a larger wave in the fall or winter and then followed by smaller waves. And so unfortunately, this pattern is similar to the uh, Spanish flu pandemic, when there was a smaller wave in early 1918 and then followed by a huge spike that fall and a third major wave in early 1919. And uh, the reason for <laughs> the subsequent large peak is because people got tired of wearing their masks. And so people would go out without their masks on and be coughing on each other and breathing on each other. And hence you get a giant wave and nobody wants that. And then the third less likely scenario is the slow burn of ongoing viral transmission without um, any clear sort of wave pattern. Um, and so that would vary geographically and be influenced um, with various degrees of mitigation measures. So uh, in general, uh, of course, we've all been living with this and adapting to this for several months now. And uh, I think we've learned a lot as we've done it, but, but we do have to create a new normal for ourselves. And so uh, thinking about uh, how we live our lives, uh, what it means to be out in the world, what it means to be a Christian in this time, I think those are all the types of things that, that we'll be examining and, and really trying to grapple with and, and understand. Uh, how do we how do we continue to do good in the world and how do we do our spiritual practices? See, stop sharing. There we go. Okay. Was that the last slide? Great. Thank you all so much. Um, uh, Alex, do you have anything you want to add to this? No, I think that was really, really well done. So thank you. And I agree with everything that's been said. I think the, the main point is that this is something that is going to be, it's not going to finish anytime soon. We can expect another 12, 18 months to two years and we have to establish a new normal. And really, uh, everything at this point, um, until there is a cure or a vaccine or herd immunity, is figuring out what this new normal is and basically mitigating risk to the best uh, way we can while establishing some sort of normalcy. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? I think I saw. Uh, Kemp and then John. Uh, let me see if I can unmute you, Kemp. Got it. Okay. You hear me? Yep. So this this is this is kind of a silly question, but it, it keeps bugging me and and uh, the, the presentation just now reiterates again the, the importance of a mask. However, when we started this, when, we whole, when the, this whole thing started, uh, even, even Fauci, Dr. Fauci was saying, well, we're not sure about masks. So what, where was the change in that um, understanding uh, of how important that might be? So I'll give it a stab and then Alex should answer as well. But 
Um, I think the initial focus was really on uh, the fomites. So the heavier droplets, uh, because those were, are bigger and more moist and then they drop to a surface. And so uh, the emphasis was really around touching things and then you know touching your, your face or any mucous membranes. Um, and then once it became clear that the virus could also survive in, in the smaller droplets uh, that are more aerosolized or, or you know, easier to transmit uh, through uh, deep breaths, uh, that's, as that data started to emerge, that's when the flip came on having masks be so important. Thanks. Alex? I can, I can, uh, yeah, I can give another perspective as well. So, you know, this was actually a major debate that uh, those within the administration had. And the reason for that is actually a little bit more practical. And it's that, um, oh, what happened to me? And it's that uh, they did not want the public to go on a run of masks and therefore uh, have healthcare workers without any sort of protection because there was already a significant shortage, uh, which is why when you saw the recommendation for masks, the recommendation is for non-medical masks, for fabric masks. And uh, that was kind of the, 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 the thought that they could best kind of draw that or walk down that fine line. Thank you, John. Yeah, hi. I've, I've got two sets of questions. I'll ask the first set or first question, and then other people, and then I, I can come back to me. So I'm interested in um, relative risk, and what I mean by that is, uh, for those of us maybe who stay at home, um, we're not going to have much risk, as, as you obviously pointed out. On the other hand, um, there are lots of people out there who are doing what you might call risky things. So for instance, the bar, I just got a Facebook post, the bars are opening on Saturday, right? So um, yeah, bars that are restaurants are opening on Saturday, but nonetheless, the bars are opening on Saturday and they're gonna be packed. If you saw the video today, the, um, the casinos in Vegas are packed. Um, if you see the news from the last two weeks, uh, the protests in the streets are packed. So we're getting a lot of uh, potential spread, lots and lots and lots. So for people who are um, kind of going about their daily life without just staying at home, um, the spread, it's, it, it occurs to me, is, is pretty large, or it, it, uh, large may be the wrong term, but it's, it, there's, there's going to be a lot of spread. So my question is then, um, if I'm a person who goes to the bars and you know goes out and does these kinds of things that a big chunk of people are doing in the country, um, what's the added risk of my going to church? Versus, you know, so, uh, you know, now I understand if I'm a person who stays home and I go to church, my added risk is quite large. Uh, but if I'm living my life like many, many people are, what's my added risk for going to church? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's a precise calculation for you, John, but uh, there was an article today about bubbles um, uh, where, um, uh, for instance, some people I know with little kids uh, go crazy right and so what they did was they partnered with their neighbor house who also had little kids and then the parents could take turns uh working <laughs> or taking care of the kids and so they created a bigger bubble than just their household and um uh, the paper today was showed three different types of bubbles if it was bubbles within the same age group bubbles within the same um like social group and mm -hmm. what was the other one and self-selected bubbles so it's like your close friends or, or some people you socialize with and they found the third one was the most effective um, but of course all of them has a have a risk of spread uh, but I would just say so the more bubbles you're in uh, the more risk there is I, I guess it's not quite my question um, well, I guess what I'm saying is lots of people are not in bubbles they're just out, I mean, I mean the, mm -hmm. the idea of that idea, some people are. I mean, there's definitely maybe many people on this call are. Um, and there also is quite a large group of people who are not doing that. And so, uh, and, and, and again, again, because we're talking about reopening our church, I guess what I'm looking at is what does that mean? So going to church is going to mean a large increase in risk, I think, for some people. Particularly people maybe like Lynn, who stays completely home, and maybe some other people here. Um, I see Greg is raising his hand, so you might want to meet him here in a minute. Um, and then, uh, 
but I guess maybe it, in, I'm not saying myself necessarily, because this wouldn't be the case, but for other people that I know personally and, and, and just see out and about, you know, they're everywhere. So they're going to bars, they're going to casinos, they're going to protests, they're doing all this sort of stuff. And so if this kind of stuff is happening, and it's happening across society, uh, I'm not so sure. And again, I'm trying to get some kind of relative ranking here. Okay, uh, you know, not precise, of course. But I'm just, my thought process is, is that maybe we shouldn't worry so much about church because the individual people should, and individual people should think of their own risk tolerance and, and what's going on in their life and whether they should go or not. But as an but as a sort of a, oh my gosh, we're spreading COVID concern, maybe it's not really that big a concern because there is so much greater spread, vastly greater spread throughout society. Well, there, there is that uh, slide that Anna had, which actually is really good, that shows the relative risk. So I don't know if you want to show that again. I think that, I think, uh, I think that you know, the, the high risk um, where, it's, where it's talking about church, I actually think that doesn't necessarily apply in ours. Those are mostly from super spreader events with like mega churches that they've had in Korea or down in the South. So that may not necessarily um, represent kind of the risk that we would have. And I think there's a lot of things that we could do um, in our own church that would decrease that risk. But you're totally right. This is not going to be something where we can completely eliminate risk. But I think there are a lot of things that we can do to decrease the risk as much as possible. So, so I think John is actually raising an interesting point of discussion for this community. So as a community, we're all trying to figure out here how to be safe with each other, okay? Our Holy Trinity community, we're trying to figure out how to be safe with each other. Part of that is if you have a personal you know, issue with health or a senior or whatever, maybe you don't wanna take that personal risk and attend church in person. On the flip side of that coin, if you're in an activity or if your job puts you in exposure to COVID on a regular basis, maybe in the interest of the church community, you should not be coming to church in person, but should be worshiping, you know, online. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? I, I want to second what Greg just said. It's like if, if you're somebody who's exposed to, to a lot, or if you want to go to bars and, and such, it's, it's your decision. But I think as a community, we would, we would encourage you to not come to church in that case. So this is Randy. Um, sorry, I have one point to that. So I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this and really in this, the same context. And the one challenge for me in that, um, my concern is, is that different people, to John's point, different people have different risk tolerances. And that's fine. The, the challenge is, is that those people may not be making may be doing things that they don't think are risky and therefore they are not going to exclude themselves from participation in a community. And to me, that's, that's what's problematic about this, right? I mean, if everybody had the same risk tolerance and we knew what they were doing, or I knew what they were doing, right? So at least for me personally, making the decision about coming back to church or any community, right? I mean, even going back to work or whatever else, I'm looking at it from that perspective of that. I don't necessarily know that yeah, this person that I know quite well and whatever, they may do things that they don't think are risky that I'd be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you've done that. And I have no idea that they did that and I'm interacting with them now. So, you know, that's, for me, that's the hard part about it. I'm not, and that's not a judgment on anybody, right? That's just a difference in human nature, right? If we looked at how we react to different situations, we all behave in different ways and that's, that's just part of who we are. But I think that is something, it's important to note just because it's like, well, yeah, people shouldn't be doing risky things, but your definition of risky and mine may be very different, right? And there may be things that I would do that you have no idea I've done, and then we come together, right? So yeah, just another perspective. Thanks. Does anybody have any other questions? Um, I sent you all... Uh, I have a second set of questions. 
I had two questions. If everybody's asked, then I got one more. If that's okay. A ask your question, John. Okay, yeah. So this is this is actually less related to church, just related maybe to me and other people in general. Um, so look, look, looking at this, uh, one slide you didn't show, and, and maybe you just know the top of your head, or maybe Alex knows this. Um, what's my level of concern? In other words, uh, it, it'll, it's obviously going to be be tiered by age. So I'm kind of getting up there. You know, I'm 64, so I've probably got a little greater concern than some other people, maybe less than some other people on this on this chat. Um, so uh, I guess you know. So hey, yeah, we got to stop the spread. This is this is important, but most you know most. 25% of people have no symptoms and I don't know, 90% have symptoms that, you know, they stay at home and kind of like any other kind of sickness. And the big concern is, is the people who are getting the worst symptoms. Um, and that clearly tears by age. But so, you know, if I'm 30 and I'm, I, this is not related to church. I'm just curious. Okay. Is that, you know, if I'm 30, you know, do I really care? I mean, one person in San Mateo County, you know, if I'm 90, I really should care. So I guess what I'm asking is, is kind of what's the percentage um, chances of me or any me, and maybe there's some slide you can find and send out to people that shows the tears um, of having a very, very serious, either either serious hospitalization or death uh, from this. Uh, my understanding is, is now like death is like maybe, well, I've seen a lot of figures. So I, I, I'll just let that percentage, you know, what's the percentage of serious hospitalization and death, I guess across people who get COVID, but probably better looking is, you know, by age. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I just want to jump in because for me, the biggest thing that I've been thinking about related to this, to this pandemic is like, yeah, I'm worried I'll get sick and it'll be bad, but I'm much more worried about either getting sick or being asymptomatic and giving it to people. Um, even though, um, at least in the, the stats from the presentation I'm in, the, uh, one of the immortal uh, groups where nobody's died yet. Um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm really much more worried about giving it to somebody that's going to happen to me. Dude, you got to get on a plane in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm still worried, much more worried about transmitting it to other people than than what's going to happen to me. I, I guess I just had a generalized question about just what's the, you know, why, you know, it, 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 I, I get Ari's concern, and, and that's, that's not what I'm asking about. I'm just asking, but if I get sick, What's my chance of going, you know, if I'm 30, what's my chance versus if I'm my age of severe? So, so, so some of the risk factors for severe disease in, include, of course, age, uh, gender, but also um, uh, other general health conditions, right? So any comorbidities, uh, there's a long list of them, but it includes diabetes, cardiac, um, uh, lung diseases. Um, I guess I like, maybe half a percent of people die who get the disease. I don't know. Third of a percent? I, I don't even know. It's three percent, fifteen percent. Alex, do you have? Do you know what that is? And that that that's wide. I understand that. So that's really more nice. So yeah, the, the real overall the yeah. real overall mortality rate is probably about 0.1 to 0.3 percent. But I think you're absolutely right. There are definitely some risk factors such as your age, your comorbidities, uh, but some other things to consider. And these are anecdotes that I've seen. Is that I've also seen 30 year old people who are perfectly healthy die. And yeah. the problem that I've seen with this disease is that oftentimes it's hard to predict who is going to get sick and not have any problems. I've had a patient that is 103 and got over COVID without any problems, but I've also had 30 year olds um, look fine one day, two hours later, they're dead. Um, and so that's one of the things that's scary for me that it's very hard to predict, um, even though you can, you can uh, you can tell by risk factor. And then the other concern that I have is, you know, if everyone, if everyone um, who is relatively low risk uh, is somewhat laissez-faire about their behavior, um, they can be asymptomatic spreaders, um, just like Eric was talking about. Um, I would say about two to four percent of the population you can consider to be an asymptomatic um, person who's carrying it and will spread it to other people. Uh, which is why mask wearing is so important, even if you have no symptoms. Um, and then, of course, the, the other concern is that if there is too big of a caseload for the healthcare system to manage, then even if your disease is you know, moderate, we may not be able to uh, provide the, enough supportive care that will see you through it, and you'll have a much worse outcome. And so 
those are kind of all the other considerations in addition to the risk factors, kind of the personal risk factors that, uh, that you talked about. Thank you, Alex. Um, let's, uh, let's focus our, like, let's focus a little more like now on church. <laughs> and and we, we have the kind of the same language. We, we kind of understand what's going on with COVID right now. Um, but what does that mean for us? Um, there's been guidelines that have been, been suggested by our own denomination, the ELCA. They've kind of put out a document that I gave to you all. California has put out its own document, uh, this one that I sent to you all. Um, and then just more recently, the San Mateo County Health has put out its own document. And each of them are slightly um, different. Uh, on what it suggests that we should do. Our own county has suggested, and this, and this is just a matter of who can meet, is that anybody who's 50 or older stays home. Um, and that is, um, you know, that's, that's younger than what other um, uh, documents have suggested. If you're 65 uh, or 60, you stay home. But, but our particular county just says, you know, uh, those above 50 or those with uh, chronic health conditions uh, stay home. Uh, and so for our own congregation, you know, Nathan and, and Josh and I would be, you know, <laughs> worshiping together um, and, you know, Hazel, but, but that doesn't necessarily, I, I, I'm trying to think of anybody else who's in that kind of age range. <laughs> um, uh, that's that's younger than 50. Um, and I say that with the utmost love to all of you. Um, there we go. The Shepherd Voorhees. Yes, they're... they're um, we can go. They can go. Um, so, yeah. and and that is on... There, also, I hope you all looked at, because I don't want to say everything that this document said, but, you know, um, some of the things that... that the document doesn't say, but I was a part of a webinar recently that particularly talked about singing in church. And even with outdoor singing, they suggest not to do it. Um, and, and that also means group recitations like the litanies that we do, um, praying together, uh, the, the group that I was a part of saying it, it would be best not, not to do that. Um, so considering what would be safe, um, it actually, I'm wondering how, what we would do in worship. And, and you know, it, it seems like it would be group, it, it seems like it would be more of like a Bible study with a sermon. Because um, it, it, part of the document also says, no food, no passing of the food. Uh, no, um, so, you know, communion is out right now in that way. Um, and I'm thinking of all the things that would have to be adjusted. Is it more of a benefit to be together or is it more of a benefit to continue worshiping virtually? And, and that's my, that's my tension right now. Um, considering everything that, uh, we would have to put in place. And that includes, um, you know, uh, how we would, you know, I'd have to preach with a mask on. I don't know how that's going to work. Um, that, that, that actually doesn't seem like a very fun thing to me. Um, uh, so I, I just, I, if you've looked at the documents, if you've studied them, I, I want to hear your thoughts. So Greg, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Please. So uh, Pastor, maybe it'd be helpful for you to talk a little bit what your plan in the near term is for online services because i know that's going to be different yes yes uh thank you greg i appreciate that, that will, so that so will give us an opportunity to experience that for some certain period of time and then make another decision after that thank thank you for saying that i appreciate that um so um after this week for worship is actually provided for us by the elca so um, our presiding bishop and our local bishop have provided a service for us that we're going to be 
putting on YouTube. Um, so, so, but after that, on the, starting on the 14th, we have stopped collaborating with Unity Lutheran and Good Shepherd Lutheran. And we're actually gonna move to um, continue to do recorded worship services, but I've been asking people to record themselves um, doing certain parts of the liturgy. So Barbara Padilla is gonna be reading our scripture for us on the 14th. And what I'm doing is I've turned into a, an editor and I'm taking these videos and I'm editing the service together. I have Kai coming in next week and he's gonna actually record a few pieces of music that we can use. Um, so at my thinking is, you know, we've done the collaborative worship for two and a half months, which has been great because it got us through this initial period. But I, I really feel like we need to change it up a little bit. And, and so um, part of that is also asking people to record music. If you have a child that plays an instrument, we can, we can record them and do a postlude uh, for the worship service. So, so it, it's, it's us as a community worshiping together again, um, and we get to see each other's faces. Uh, so um, that's, that's where I'm at. And, and I would actually, um, that, that's where I'm at with this. And, and um, that's going to start on the 14th. Uh, Gigi, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just like, wanted to just sort of chime in with, with what Greg said. Um, I think that uh, I feel really excited about the next phase here with us all, you know, anyone who feels like contributing, uh, whether it's doing a re recorded, uh, you know, rec uh, recording the liturgy, um, music, singing, um, and, you know, collaborating like you said together um because it, from what it sounds like if we did get together in person there'd be like can't say the liturgy about no singing you you'd have to preach with a mask on we'd all have to have masks on and stay pretty far apart from each other um you know and we're taking a risk you know i mean we are taking risks to do it um Peter and I are over 50, uh, so we wouldn't even get to come. <laughs> um, oh, and I had a question about that. I didn't get to read those documents, Pastor. I, I miss seeing them somehow. Anyway, but is it like stay home until 2022? Or what was the, was it just uh, open-ended? It, it doesn't say. These, these doesn't things are say. constantly being updated. Um, yeah. and, and I think, um, yeah, they're, they're being updated. Uh, for okay. churches, and and I think they're reevaluating after 21 days. Um, is is if I think I read that somewhere, I forget who is reevaluating this. Maybe it's the the county. But um, one of the things also is uh, I am not willing myself to put you all at risk to test out whether it's okay to go to church again. I don't <laughs> want us to be. I don't want us to be ahead of the pack on this. I want us to be at the end of it because I'm just I'm just not willing to put us at risk. Um, which is very interesting because I was thinking about our own risk factors and, you know, we, we as a congregation, we are willing to risk ourselves, we're not willing to risk other people. And what, and what I mean by that is in January, when we were getting death threats, everyone still came to church. A lot of, a lot of people still came to church because they weren't, they were, you know, and some people showed up and said, I'll risk myself, but, but some people aren't, but now we're going, oh, I could spread it to different people. So I don't want to risk giving it to somebody if I have it. So it's our risk tolerance is, it seems like we're willing to risk ourselves, but we're not willing to risk other people. That's how I'm, I'm really seeing this. Um, and, and, and I'm very grateful for that. Kemp, do you want to say something? Okay, so... So one of the one of the congregations I served um, <clears throat> um, is doing now. This is Gethsemane Lutheran in Seattle, and they have a technology. I don't know. Maybe you're familiar with this, uh, Josh, or anybody else. It's called Vimeo. V i v i v e m o something v -I -M -E -O. like that. V i m e o. Yeah. Yeah. Vimeo. I know Vimeo. 
Okay, so so I don't know if it, if if it's the platform or what, but uh, they are they have been doing what you're talking about. The they they the pastors create the the day and so on and so on off of the text and say, but they have they have asked people usually two weeks ahead uh, to do this particular piece, that particular piece, uh, based on their own creative insights on that day. And they put together this kind of seamless piece where you're constantly seeing the, your, you know, your, your fellow congregants. I mean, they're just, it's a stream of, it's almost like you're, it's almost like you're together. No. That's how intimate it can yeah, become. And that's what Josh is talking about. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to be doing it through YouTube. Uh, I'm going to be uploading it to YouTube, but I'm, I'm editing it all together. And this is, I, it's a learning curve. I spent three hours this, <laughs> this week just trying to edit stuff together that I've received. And once I learn it, it'll be easier to do once I have that down. But, course, but it's, it's, we'll be, it's, Vimeo is like a platform like YouTube. And so we'll just be, we're, we're going to, we have our own YouTube channel and that's what we're going to be doing, Kemp. Is, yeah. Is that well, it, there. It, it sounds great. And that would be far, far more exciting than to enter in, you know, to even give thought of entering into a sanctuary with, with people in masks. Mm -hmm. How boring is that? Yeah. Pamela, so, you wanted to say something? And then I, I have actually hands up, I think, from Sandy and Alex. Uh, but go ahead, Pamela. Say what you wanted to say. Okay. Well, my hand was up also, but I guess I may have put it up after I started just talking in. Um, Kim, I was really happy to hear you say that because I'm, I, the Pastor and I were talking about that earlier. And we've begun, I've, I, I volunteered to work with him to, to recruit people to uh, participate musically in the services. And I've already reached out to one family. I'll be reaching out to others. I'll be reaching out to you as well, because we we discuss that same thing. And that what's missing is that seeing of each other, and that sh that it's our service, and that we're seeing ourselves there uh, worshiping, um, and that we really wanted to see people reading the um, reading the lecture, um, reading um, chanting the psalms, um, um, singing the hymn of the day. Um, and so um, in doing the intercession prayers, and so I know pastor's already begun that. I've already spoken to Gigi and her family about perhaps doing a piece. I'm hoping we can get, I, I know I'm doing a piece. I'm going to be talking to other people. And we're going to try and start compiling music um, um, for that very purpose so that we can start having it be our service. Yeah. And, and one of the things that, that really, I would appreciate if you get asked to do a piece of music, do it sooner rather than later because I have to edit it all together. And so it would be great to have a, a, you know, a repertoire of stuff that I can pull from in order to design the service because it, it does take time. And, and I, I really, I myself, it, I will be stressed having to preach, but also to go like, ah, I don't have a hymn of the day. Uh, so, so please, please, if you're thinking about providing some sort of service, uh, give it to me sooner rather than later. I'm already working on the 14th so, so that we, could, I can, we can get ahead of this. Um, Alex, did you want to say some, something? And then yeah, say yeah, I, I do. Um, you know, I, as, as we mentioned, I think this is something that uh, we should probably anticipate being in for the next one to two years. And so I can't fathom us not getting together in person somehow over that long amount of time. And so I do think, it, and may not be next week, but I think at some point, um, I think we do need to reestablish normality. And I think we can do that just with some new protocols, new behaviors, new practices. And I think the ones that are in the documents that you provided, I, um, I thought of my own, and then I looked at them, and I thought they were actually all pretty good. Um, but I think by coming up with some new procedures, we really can mitigate the risk as much as possible. I'm not saying that it would eliminate risk, but I think we could make it relatively low. And so, you know, I think it's appropriate to think about how we could get back together in person. I think if we do it in a measured way. Uh, if we have good practices. I think if it's well thought out and executed, it could be done in a way that's 
you know, relatively low risk. And so, you know, I, I think in doing this with the operations at the hospital and minimizing risk, I've really found that the devil's in the details here. And so I looked at some of those policies, I thought of some of my own, and I think, you know, just some of the things that are off the top of my head that I think, you know, would work to, to kind of get us back together would be, you know, I think first and foremost, we have to recommend um, that those people who are higher risk, they have exposures that are of older age, that have comorbidities that we recommend that they not come and, you know, let them know that they shouldn't feel obligated to come in person. And I think, you know, things that we can do at the door, like um, asking screening questions, if we can get one of those handheld thermometers, um, we can implement social distancing within the, within the sanctuary with, you know, spaced out seating. Actually, if we could, with the weather being nice, if we could even do it outside, that would really mitigate risk quite a bit. You know, we, I think um, we'd have to do some things that are different. I think, you know, no holy water, no handshaking. Everyone does have to wear masks. Um, we probably need to change communion some way, somehow. Um, and then I, I do agree that singing is one thing that we do probably have to get rid of. But I, I think that's not the same sort of risk as doing recitations, for example. I think the risk for both of those is fairly different. The singing, I actually think, is an aerosolizing procedure and is a relatively high risk, whereas recitations, if you do it with a mask on in your distance, is no different than if you're just talking. Okay. Um, and I think we have to do things like probably get rid of childcare, um, probably get rid of snacks at fellowship and kind of have to talk from a distance. But at the same time, and I think if we do all of those things and maybe think of some other ones that are in those documents, we could probably do it in a way that is relatively safe. Thank you. Sandy? Okay. Yeah, my, uh, the, is kind of a lead into my question for both you and Alex, and that is, what is the county's plan or what have you heard for as places are starting to open is there a magic number on if there's so much of a rise, are they going to shut everything down again? What have you heard? Because right now we're, we're kind of going gradual, gradual, gradual. Are they going to say, okay, so many more cases shut down again? Or kind of what's the, have, what have you heard about that? Yeah, so I, I think there will be flare ups like, um, like those models that Anna showed that, you know, there are a couple different ways in which you can model it. But I anticipate that there probably will be additional flare-ups over the next couple of years. I think probably the next one will be in the fall in conjunction with the flu season. And so I think what the county is looking at is whether or not they have P enough PPE and enough testing for, um, for the hospitals and uh, what, the, what the census of COVID patients are in the hospitals, on ventilators, and just the general number in the county. And I think those, they have thresholds set to determine when they have to restart the lockdown or ramp things back down. And so I think we can anticipate over the next um, 12 to 18 months, we probably will kind of ebb and flow with regard to how restrictive things are. And so I think if we're able to kind of set policies uh, or protocols ourselves and you know be able to be nimble about it, we may be able to kind of uh, adapt to that. But that's a great question. And then are we, since we're kind of a public gathering place, are we, um, obligated to do any kind of like sign-in procedures so that there's contact tracing. I know I've heard a lot of people saying that their workplaces are doing, um, you have to sign in every day, you have to answer all the, sh the questions um, so that if there is any incidents, they can do good contact tracing. So I'm just wondering if we, is that something we would have to do on a weekly basis? I don't think it's a requirement um, for the county, but I think it would be a, a nice um, a nice thing to do just in case anything happens. It would uh, make the job for the contract tracer a lot easier. Sager Harris? So um, a couple of things that, that I know I've sort of picked up on from um, That's okay. talking to other clergy and checking what um, things people are doing. One thing I've noticed is it, like Kemp says, there's some churches and, and it's not necessarily big fancy churches that have been doing a really good job of doing these stitched together videos of worship. Um, and in fact, the Good Friday service, if I had 
if I had decided to use video on that and ask people to send video clips rather than sound clips, which actually might have been easier because then I wouldn't have had to find a hundred pictures of stones online that had no copyright prescription, just um, restrictions on them. Um, that's essentially what that service would have been. So it's possible. I will point out, and it's, it's a learning curve. And so for Josh, it's going to be very time consuming. Um, for a little while and it will still be time-consuming. I have friends who have been doing this for their churches for a couple months now And they're really tired um, And if we do that, it's going to be really important like Josh said that if he, if he Asks people to do stuff that they send him the stuff because that's the other frustration. I'm hearing from um, Pastors is it's really hard after a while to keep people motivated to do that But I've seen some really lovely things with that like one of my um, one of my friends who's in Florida I watched hers and um, they do, they actually sort of, I think have encouraged people in their congregation to record some of their pieces outside. And so there's these lovely pieces where you can hear birds in the background. And um, they've also, instead of having um, passing of the piece, they have just very brief greetings from people in the congregation who might not be comfortable reciting liturgy, but just say, you know, hi, we're here we are and we're excited to be here this morning. And that's been really nice to see. Um, it's a great idea. Thank you. That's really great. Yeah. One of the other things to remember about um, when we when we regather too is there are actually more restrictions. There's some restrictions that um, that aren't listed, but that we have to think about really seriously. And I'm guessing that um, I, I think, for instance, like, it's not just a matter of not having child care, and we are a really child-friendly congregation in many ways, but it's going to be really hard to bring early elementary children back to church because it's hard to talk to them about what they can and cannot do um, and how to keep distance. And I, and I realize that maybe by January, all five-year-olds are going to be really good at staying away from people and not touching them and sneezing into their elbow, but they, they aren't good at following directions. Um, and so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard for, um, it actually is going to be hard even for people who fall in that under 50 age category to return to public worship of any kind, because we really do have to restrict. And frankly, if you think about it, if I put, if we put all of you back in a room together, you're going to have to be, you're going to really, really, really have to work not to get excited and shake hands, not to give somebody a hug. And if you're, and I want you to imagine that you're standing outside the church building and you're talking to someone from your congregation who you love and who you haven't seen in ages, and you've been good for the last hour about not touching them and they burst into tears. And you have to remember that you can't get closer to them. And I think that's gonna be really hard for smaller congregations especially um, to follow those rules. And so that's, and it may be something that, that we learn and that we have to learn, but I think that's something you have to take into account um, as you think through, are we, what is it gonna look like for us to gather again? Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Go ahead, Tiger Hammers. Yes, well, let's see a couple. I'm going back to your your plan, Josh, to stitch together uh, people <coughs> participating by video and online in that way. And um, I'm just thinking too to be sure. I, what I've really enjoyed um, when we do get on that Gethsemane one is that the 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 hymns are printed out. Is there a way for Kai to do the accompaniment for any hymns? Because I don't know about the rest of you, but it feels really good to sing mm -hmm. at home even, but knowing that we're all singing the same song. So in, in my vision of this, there would be one hymn that we sing together and it would be led by somebody from the congregation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know. I honestly don't know how I would stitch together Kai playing music and somebody trying to sing on top of that um, because oh. they can't be in the same room together. So, so I, I just, I just don't, I just don't know how that would work. Um, but, but my, my thinking is that, you know, if families, musical families can, you know, 
do hymns together or even somebody doing it a cappella. I mean, uh, and then we sing it together. I would, I am, the way I have the videos set up um, is I'm also gonna have a bulletin that I email everybody every week so that you have both access to the YouTube video and to the, um, and to the, the bulletin so that you could, you can follow along. Um, would have the words. You it mean, will have the words. Yes. The hymns words. The hymn will be the 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 words to the hymn will be will be put in there. So um, I think if there's accompaniment, um, and it's a kind of familiar hymn, then people can sing without seeing the music necessarily. I don't know. But. Or people can. I mean, maybe I could have Kai just play the hymn, and yeah. and we just sing at home and yes. not have somebody leading it necessarily. That's what I was thinking mm -hmm. of. Okay, I, uh, I, I'm processing this with you all, so I, I think that that might be a good idea too. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Looks like Josh has got an idea and I've got one too. Go ahead, Josh. Where? Oh, um, I do, uh, for the community theater that I was just a part of, uh, our show got canceled and on the day that we released a video of all of us singing the last number from the show together, and we were all able to record ourselves singing. And uh, we listened to the accompaniment with a headphone. And so the recording that we took was just of our voice and our face. And the, then um, one of the people in the cast uh, took all of those and they were able to together with the accompaniment of the music. And so we were able, as long as everyone was in time, we were able to get all the harmonies and stuff. Um, I could learn how to do that if that's something that people would be interested in. I could do that. Um, um, you and I will talk, I will talk to you both later and, yeah. and I will try to maybe get, um, see, this is great. Uh, I'll try to get uh, uh, Pamela on board with this. And so that we could figure out how to get this done. Um, Cause we do have choir members and maybe we could try to do a choir piece too in some way. Uh, so I will be in contact with you in the next couple of days, but that's a, thank you for offering that. I, I really appreciate that. You the young people will save the day too. Younger <laughs> people. Sorry, Josh. <laughs> uh, I want to, I want to let Barbara Padilla talk cause she hasn't really uh, had a chance to speak yet. So Barbara, go ahead. Okay. Well, I read a lot of that stuff because I was interested in where we were and I read the, the update today, I mean, they're, they're encouraging up to 100 individuals to meet, you know, in any kind of, you know, setting. And um, so I want to back down to the small groups of 10, you know, because we're, I think we uh, have functioned so positively is in small groups of talking to each other, caring for each other, praying together. Adult forum is always usually under 10. You know, so maybe for um, the age group that's appropriate, maybe something where you do um, Zoom meetings once a week for um, a group that is interested in a time slot, and then you can do some visiting that's personal, that's a small group. And that can be a small youth group, it can be getting the children all online for some appointed time, um, and they see each other, you know, and they interact for a very short time because I know attention span's not there, but how are we going to continue to build that small caring sense that we have as a congregation here? Um, I had a whole list of things that I was going to say I could do and volunteer to come and prep the place so that we could meet. But, you know, from everything I've heard, it just doesn't sound like the best because of my, my hopes were there, but I don't want to expose anyone, and I certainly am not in the age bracket that allows us to be there. Mm -hmm. So um, it makes me mad. <laughs> but I think we have opportunities, and let's continue with this terrific opportunity for the meetings on Sunday, you mm -hmm. know, the Zoom meetings of church, because yep. that's still holding us together. But yeah, one of the things, Barbara, and I've I've been think I'm I've been thinking about that, and and so, you know, I'm I have offered one time where people can show up and and just check in, and um, and today no one showed up, and that's that's fine because but I think people are a little a little Zoom fatigued out. I think people and and uh, I, I I so so I'm I'm trying to I'm I don't want to offer too much 
because I don't want people to, I already feel like people are, are starting to, if they have an option, not be a part of a Zoom meeting. Um, right. And, and, yeah, and even, even during school right now, yeah. um, uh, like I asked folks to color a page and send me a picture um, for in one of our emails. No one did it, and that's fine. Uh, but but I I just think that you know I we have to meet people where they're at, and so to have all of to suddenly come up with a bunch of different things, um, I don't know that that is necessarily the best thing for our community. I'm offering small things here and there, but I does that does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Greg. So um, what I think I'm kind of hearing right now in terms of um, in-person worship it was we're going to be in this online mode for months not weeks is that a reasonable assumption first my my i what i would like to see happen is i'd like to say for the month of june and july we do online and then okay. we revisit it for august so maybe come back in july in the middle of july and say okay where are we at well, right, and that, that kind of leads into my next question. How, is there gonna be some indicator, some clue that's gonna make us decide, especially you as our leader, but at least a group of us ready to come together, and maybe Alex has an expert opinion on this, but is there some, you know, what kind of indicator do you think we're gonna have that tells us okay, it's time to come back into our church. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, Alex, Lori? I mean, I think for, for me, it was about flattening the curve, making sure that the healthcare uh, systems capacity is able to manage, and then looking at what the, basically looking at the curve go up and then start to go down. And so I think that's actually why um, Scott Morrow, the county health, um, officer um, put out the statement that it would be okay to open up to um, to in-person services. I think that many of the things that we needed to see uh, to make sure that we could mitigate risk as much as possible, we have seen. And so I think the next part is making sure that, you know, if we are to do it, we need to be able to operationalize that and have the uh, congregation willing to accept that. And then also uh, seeing kind of what the risk tolerance of everyone uh, in our congregation and you as well, Pastor. Yeah. And, and um, I will say that survey that I sent out, the initial results, we had 40 people uh, respond. So 41 people respond so far, um, individuals that is. And, and most people um, are in the category of let's wait. Um, let's, let's wait and see. Um, so I don't think there's a rush from those 40 people, um, you know, to, to come back and, and start meeting right away. Um, and so it, it, it just seems like that's, people's risk tolerance is not there yet. Um, and maybe nothing changes, maybe it, we stay in the same, you know, we're the same level, but we just need more time to get comfortable with it. And like Alex said, really start to uh, institutionalize our operations in a way that can help you know, or to mitigate risk. Go ahead, Smuckles. Oh, you, oh. me? Uh, uh, Peter and, and Gigi wanted to say something. Uh, for me personally, it doesn't really make sense to meet in person until we can have communion. Because communion is such an essential part of, of, the, of meeting in person. If, if we can't have communion, to me, it's like, what's the point? So that for me is the threshold where, you know, we, we need to be able to do that or else it's not really, it's not really a, much gained in meeting in person. Yeah, well, thank you for saying that. I, um, I, will, I, I will say one of the things that I've um, w in planning for the 14th is uh, it will be a recorded service, but at, right after the recorded service, I'd like to go into a Zoom meeting for us to take communion together through Zoom. Um, that's, that's where, so I would, I would ask you all to put out your own elements and then we would, we would do a communion together. I, my own personal 
theology and piety won't allow me to have it recorded. <laughs> I feel like it, it should be done live and with the community. Um, and, and so I, that's one thing that I, 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 we're going to try to do. And if somebody is not able to have the elements for communion, I'll try to make sure that they get them. Um, so, uh, thank you. I, I forgot that I wanted to say that as well. Um, John, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just, um, as we go forward and, and listening to folks and hearing Erica and, and, and Greg and some others, um, we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so I, I, I'm suggesting to all of you, uh, have, we have friends all around the country and we have friends who are Lutherans and other traditions and just learn what they're doing because there might be some ideas that are good for us. I mean, I, my former church um, that I was at before I came back to Holy Trinity, they're doing communion now um, and they're doing it live in person and they have a way of doing it, but they're definitely doing it. So, um, I'm just saying that there's just think about these things and, and listen and, and, and maybe we'll have some ideas that we could bring. Um, we don't have all the wisdom in this group, a lot of wisdom in this group, but there's other folks out there too. So I don't think we want to reinvent the wheel. And then pastor in regards to just uh, some of this filming, um, IG live, double, double people up, sing and play and then video that and plop it in your video. And now you've got a leader and a music and it's all on video. So thanks. Um, that should be relatively, relatively easy but um yeah i think we can do it that way we can talk about it more later okay does anybody else have anything they want to add go ahead Sager hammers and then uh schmuckles you can go after the Sager hammers so <clears throat> in in case in the in the octave of uh pentecost um there is a there's a wonderful video that the association of lutheran church musicians put together and uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this. I put it on our Facebook page. Excellent. Oh, oh it's just so inspiring. I mean, it, it was wonderful. That's all. My sister was singing in that video. <laughs> small, <laughs> small Lutheran world. <laughs> wonderful. Michael's, go ahead. Um, this could be something I expect to, that I could talk to you about separately, Pastor. Um, but like, Laurie, you brought up at the last, you know, coffee hour Zoom about uh, a children's pageant that could be done, you know, virtually do a, somehow do it, you know, recording each kid or whatever. But after hearing about, you know, ah, the difficulties of trying to do that, um, trying to stitch something together, and I have zero experience with that. I mean, but could we talk about that later? So Absolutely. that we can determine whether that's a thing that, because I personally think that if we're going to do that, we should do it this summer. Uh, why wait for the fall when kids are going to be busy with homework and, you know, um, just the usual fall things that are. No, we, we can talk about it, Gigi. I, I think, I think it's a good okay. idea. And I, and I think beginning earlier rather than later is a good idea. Uh, yeah. That's, that's my experience so far with, with editing videos. So. Um, does anybody have anything else they'd like to say? Thank you all so much. Um, I'm so grateful that you all have uh, shown up and, and I, I miss you all dearly. Um, I miss your presence. I miss seeing you all. I, I just want to say too that uh, we are all grieving and, and we are all experiencing grief in different ways. And so um, be be good to yourselves because the world is changing and and you know you have to put on your own oxygen masks first before you can help other people so so please make sure that you're checking in with yourselves um and and you know helping yourself first because uh uh we're we're going to be in this for the long haul so um god bless you all and uh and thank you all for coming See y'all. Thanks, everyone.